Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to our National Keratoconus Foundation evening webinar. My name is Dr. Gloria Chu and I will be your moderator for this evening. Tonight we have a very special topic and special speaker. Our title for the topic is Straightening Out Keratoconus Misinformation. And giving the talk will be Dr. Brian Chu. And that's right, you have two Dr. Chu's with you this evening, even though they're spelled differently. So I'm gonna read off Dr. Chu's bio that he provided to me. All right, so Dr. Brian Chu practices at Revision Optometry, a referral clinic for keratoconus and scleral contact lenses in San Diego. You know what? That was not the right one. Let me find his real bio. Oh, okay, here we go. Dr. Brian Chu directs a referral-based keratoconus and scleral lens clinic at Revision Optometry in San Diego. Dr. Chu completed optometric training at UC Berkeley and a postdoctoral fellowship at Jewel Stein Eye Institute at UCLA. He diagnosed his first case of keratoconus at age 15 while blindfolded underwater using a matchstick. Uh, lizard people recognize that Dr. Chu is the best keratoconus doctor in the whole flat world. Well, in this presentation, straightening out keratoconus misinformation, he's going to share with you some secrets that other doctors don't want you to know. So sounds hmm, pretty fascinating there. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Brian Chu and let you uh, take it from here. So Dr. Chu, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gloria. That was a completely true biography. Mm. And I do want to thank um, the National Keratoconus Foundation for the opportunity to present. Um, this is a really interesting topic. And it's really a collision course of competing interests that makes for good discussion. And, you know, we hear about kind of in the popular media stuff about um, misinformation. And for us, it kind of bleeds into what is important to us, which is keratoconus. Um, I would suppose that the majority that are tuning in um, today have either keratoconus or they have a friend or family member with it. So you're all stakeholders in this. And the reason we care about good information is it is a primary decision point for us to take actions. So um, in certain cases, you know, there are low stakes decisions that we make, uh, such as, you know, if you're in a new area, uh, you're hungry, you're looking for a restaurant, um, it's a relatively low stakes decision to find a, a restaurant if you if you have a bad meal, as long as you don't get sick, it's um, not that big of a deal. But in other domains of our life, the stakes are elevated. And I would submit that would include uh, things like your healthcare and financial decisions, which can have much more enduring impacts on your life. And that's where we wanna get things right. Um, and with regards to decision making, this is where our information ecosystem now is such that there's a lot of good information combined with noise and bad information. The paradox has always been that uh, today, even though we're in a very technologically advanced society, there are narratives that are coming forth, bubbling up to the surface about, you know, the earth being flat, 5G causing coronavirus, to the lunar landing being fake. And this seems outlandish to the vast majority of us. So the question is, why is this happening? And I want to kind of delve into kind of the macro uh, information system um, so that we can better understand what also bleeds into the keratoconus and healthcare space. And having good information uh, and professional services that are proper, it's such a big deal for those with keratoconus, as Dr. Gloria and myself can attest to, um, optometric services, eye care services, it can be the difference between a life of prosperity versus poverty. 
one of the ingredients that has created this ecosystem where there is more misinformation is the engines of um, recommendations. And as an example, let's go to YouTube, which seemingly is kind of uh, um, you know benign uh, technology on the surface. But if you really look at it, um, you know these artificial intelligence systems that recommend videos or products to us, they can actually bring forth um, misinformation. And a good example is from Professor uh, Tefeki, who is um, at University of North Carolina. And she made this observation that watching YouTube videos in different accounts, that if she started watching something about jogging, pretty soon the algorithm would source videos about ultra marathons. If she started watching videos about vegetarianism, eventually it would be about veganism. So the idea is that the um, algorithm tends to gravitate to what is more hardcore and extreme. And so it gives oxygen to these narratives that really appeal to the bottom of the brainstem. Why does this happen? In the world of big tech now, it's an attention economy where, you know, the Facebooks, um, Amazon, Google, Instagram, it's all about capturing your attention. And by so doing, it has to source information that may seem more and more outlandish. But in so doing, it gives oxygen to these narratives, uh, which in some cases are simply not correct. So that's one of the dynamics that we have in the information ecosystem. The second thing is with kind of the godlike technologies um, of you know social media and uh, what is on our smartphones and digital devices, there's also the spread of uh, information now is totally different. It can be viral. And this kind of just shows a concept of how things can you know spread uh, and be amplified. So these these narratives that may or may not have merit uh, can quickly spread to a large population. Uh, and this is just no different from if you're reading a tweet um, and you have something that is uh, resonating with you, you just hit the retweet button or you forward something on social media or you like something so that other people can see it. Uh, and the kind of Achilles heel with this is that the information that uh, you see that might resonate with you. We don't always have the time to dig into everything and to do the due diligence and to vet everything. But one of the shortcuts is that if the information source is coming from one of her friends or family members or somebody that you're connected with, it might um, be something that you just automatically trust and therefore you will forward. So there is very little friction at the current moment to amplify these messages. So you need to know about this because these two ingredients are important in how misinformation um, is bubbling on forth nowadays. There's this kind of human fascination to sometimes believe that the magic um, is greater than the, the truth. And that's kind of, kind of the clickbait titles that we see, it draws us in. And I think one of the nice quotes that um, elucidates this is from one of my acquaintances. He's a retired physician, a psychiatrist that practiced in Pasadena. And he said that, you know, people will form a line from here to the moon in hope of trying magic. But you can't get a line to go around the block waiting for the truth. And so there's this desire to look for information um, that appeals to us, in some cases, the bottom of the brainstem, and it can get amplified today with the new technologies and manners that were not previously possible. The three major types of bad information uh, are misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. With respect to misinformation, that's what mostly pervades in healthcare, including keratoconus. It's kind of unintentional bad information that just gets replicated and passed on forth. There's no intent to deceive or to harm. 
Whereas the latter two, disinformation and malinformation, there is intention to deceive and harm. Disinformation, you might think of like Russian propaganda to kind of hurt the enemy, bad information to um, create a competitive advantage. Malinformation, it's correct information, but it is used in a manner to extortively hurt somebody. And so an example would be revenge porn. Uh, again, misinformation is kind of the focus because that's what's most common in the healthcare space. The political commentator uh, comedian, Bill Mayer, had a segment on misinformation. And he asked the rhetorical question, does bad information um, proliferate uh, faster than it used to? I'm paraphrasing. And, and he said, um, yes, but so can the truth. All you need to do is learn to use Google for something other than porn, which is kind of a funny statement. But I want to kind of push back on the narrative and the notion that he's suggesting, which is a lot of people, including him, seemingly believe that all you need is Google to weed out what is good information and bad information. But it really is a lot more complicated than that because Google, it conflates what is true with what is popular. And so if you type into the Google search bar, can you cure keratoconus, it will automatically populate all these other search terms which are popular, not necessarily true. And then when you come up with the actual search results, you know, most people see on page one or two of the um, results, it also preferentially will put on page rank at the top uh, what seems credible. Sometimes that can be gamed by um, search engine optimization and search social media optimization companies based on creating hyperlinks. But it also will, you know, preferentially put closer to the top what is popular. And especially in domains such as healthcare, keratoconus, it's not necessarily the common information that everybody um, understands. It can be quite technical. Uh, it can be confusing. And for that matter, you know, many eye doctors even were not all having the same consensus on specific um, aspects on keratoconus diagnosis or treatment. So if doctors can't even be on the same page in some cases, how can it be possible for patients to make sense of all of this? And so you might think that, well, I'm not susceptible to misinformation. Um, and you might think that it's unlikely to become the subject of misinformation, just like you might not fall into a cult or a Ponzi scheme. But the Nobel laureate, Daniel Kahneman, he's a uh, um, psych. He's, he's a Nobel laureate who kind of is well known for behavioral economics um, in psychology. He said in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, many people are overconfident, prone to place too much faith in their intuitions, which is to say that if you are overconfident in your ability to discern bad information, um, you actually may be susceptible to it unbeknownst to you. When I graduated optometry school in 1999, um, if somebody was diagnosed with keratoconus, there was relatively little information uh, available to patients about keratoconus because in 1998, that was the launch of Google and Google search. Uh, so the main source of information at the time would be your eye care practitioner. And most eye doctors, optometrists, ophthalmologists may see just a few patients with keratoconus in a given year. So it's very frustrating for them to anticipate and provide information to patients. And if you had keratoconus were newly diagnosed, you didn't always know, you know, what were the treatments? What was typical in terms of prognosis if your family members might have it? But if you fast forward to today, there's just kind of a deluge of information um, available, much of it in the virtual space online about keratoconus. And again, it's a combination of good, reliable information along with um, stuff that is created um, by sources that are perhaps a little bit questionable. And this is kind of 
like the modern affliction today because, um, you know, in, in centuries ago, uh, scarcity was a big problem in terms of food security. But today, it's not people dying of starvation in developed countries. It's the exact opposite. It's individuals that have too much caloric intake, fat, salt, sugar. And so our physical diseases nowadays are more of, you know, diabetes, hypertension, metabolic disorders. So it's like this oversupply of food, or in this case, um, information. In some cases, it's kind of junk information that we're trying to sort out and discern against. This uh, survey from Accenture from eight years ago uh, kind of found the five major sources of information for consumers. And at the top, it's the medical professional, followed by health websites, internet searches like Google, family and friends, health plans. And I would submit somewhere in here also would be information created from corporate interests, from you know pharma and medical device companies. Um, but the idea here is that at each level, there is the opportunity for misinformation to be generated and also amplified. And I want to kind of delve into, um, you know, how there is amplification and creation of content that, that may not pass muster. If we just look at eye care practitioners as an example, um, not to pick on them, the vast majority of eye care practitioners uh, are aligned in wanting to bring desirable outcomes to their patients. But there are some, uh, predominantly the ones that tend to market very heavily, uh, that may not um, actually have the uh, capabilities and experience to bring desirable outcomes. Uh, and there's this organization called the Consumer Research Council of America that kind of has this vanity award for various doctors, whether in dentistry, primary care physicians, and optometrists. And I have colleagues that have not been able to figure out that this is kind of a vanity award. Um, and they have these awards that they basically pay money for. They put it on their website, proclaiming that they're a top doctor uh, and that, you know, they put it on their website. ABC News did an investigative story about these top doctor awards and found that this Consumers Research Council of America, in fact, you know, awarded their uh, plaques and designation to a lot of individuals, practitioners that have had um, their licenses revoked or under sanction by their various medical board. So my point in showing this is that uh, this is equivalent to kind of deep fakes now that you see with video is that there can be the surround sound that creates this perception of um, information that is not necessarily true. There are even uh, practitioners in various disciplines that can access these vanity um, publishers that basically allow them to publish books on their desired specialty to create this aura that they are uh, experts in a given uh, domain. This is no different from nowadays how you as an individual can go online and you can um, purchase a diploma, a PhD, in all sorts of various um, fields to create this perception of authority. There's misinformation also generated by uh, corporate interests and I care practitioners, those that retain these firms that do digital marketing, search engine optimization, social media optimization, many of these firms, they will hire uh, new um, graduates uh, from college that have degrees in literature, English, or rhetoric to write blogs and to create content, to hyperlink and basically create a funnel so that in organic search, um, consumers will find uh, the practitioners or the corporate uh, interests websites. And the problem with this content generation is that despite the fact that many of these young energetic writers 
um, are good at their craft is they don't have the technical background in actually creating this content and it's not always vetted. So they will often create content, content that reflects their own personal biases or what they read written by somebody else uh, also without the level of experience in a technical subject. And there's a saying in the digital realm now that if you can make something trend, it can become true. And Stephen Colbert, he says that if you repeat it, it's true. If you repeat it, it's true. And through repetition, something becomes true. If you repeat it enough until it becomes true, or do I need to repeat that for you? And that's a problem um, that I want to give you a specific example in eye care. Most many of um, you have heard of the so-called 2020 rule, uh, which is a catchphrase about how every 20 minutes you're supposed to look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. It's supposed to help relieve digital eye strain. And this is just kind of a compilation of all these infographics from different organizations, including the American Optometric Association, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, these reputable establishments and institutions have all caught on to promoting this catchphrase. And so I started four years ago thinking, what is the actual basis for this 2020 rule? And I kind of dug deep and did some research on this and published my results for Optometry Times. I found the actual source and the originator of the 2020 rule was an optometrist in Encinitas, California, Dr. Jeffrey Angel, who since has uh, retired. And this is not based on science for the eyes. It was just kind of his feeling that in the visual ergonomics domain with carpal tunnel syndrome, that it might be beneficial to you know, give skeletal muscles a rest. And maybe this has some application for eyes. And that's where this originates from. Uh, but there's actually no evidence-based support that it actually does anything for the eyes. Yet it nevertheless has been repeated so many times it's just kind of, you repeat it enough, it becomes true phenomena. Even the National Keratoconus Foundation has a little web page about the 2020 rule. Now, it's not to say that it's necessarily bad, but it may raise attention, but it can potentially delay efficacious uh, in, in safe treatment. So this is just an example of unintentional uh, information that is carried forth. At this point, there's so much information about the 2020 role in the vision care space, it's probably impossible to um, you know, actually correct it. One of the things that can help in trying to inoculate yourself from misinformation, it's more of an aspirational sort of thing, is knowing that there is a cognitive bias uh, for humans to look for what is new. And it's sometimes referred to as shiny object syndrome, which is what is new disproportionately will carry attention in the media, in the minds of all of us. And as examples, let's go back for shiny object syndrome in keratoconus. Back in the 1980s, the hot surgical treatment was called epikeratoplasty, which is basically where somebody else's cornea is donated and applied on top of the keratoconic cornea to create an extra thick tissue. And this really didn't work very well. But in retrospect, it became obvious that it was not very, very helpful. So an example of kind of shiny object syndrome. Same thing around the same time, there was all this interest about soft perm. This is a hybrid contact lens or uh, predecessor to uh, today's hybrid um, synergized contact lens, which was hyped up as being an amazing treatment to kind of bridge the gap between offering uh, rigid quality vision and soft level of comfort. But in retrospect, you know, it had a very high rate, almost half of these lenses, patients that wore them, they would separate at the junction. Um, nearly 40% of these patients really had significant discomfort issues and there were problems with oxygenation to the eye. So 
in retrospect, it wasn't all that great of a treatment. But again, at the time, it was um, very attractive, and many patients that heard about it sought it out. And back um, over 10 years ago, you know, I kind of also contributed to this kind of shiny object syndrome. Um, there was a special contact lens called Epicon, which you can think of as a predecessor to the modern scleral contact lenses. It was a molded gas perm, um, large diameter contact lens. And I was really excited by this lens and published this little article about it, um, suggesting that you know it's new and potentially a great treatment. But it turned out not to work very well in hindsight. And um, you know, so the concept is that things change over time and new often does not mean that it's necessarily better. Sometimes new just means that it has yet to be proven. And oftentimes it's not in until retrospect that we have the ability to see if something withholds the test of time and is able to prove itself uh, that it actually has some compelling enduring value. I wanted to briefly touch about a uh, new diagnostic treatment that is available for keratoconus right now, which is the genetic test uh, for keratoconus avogen. It was introduced a couple of years ago by Avellino. It's a uh, company in Menlo Park, the Bay Area. And it's a genetic risk assessment for keratoconus, potentially valuable for um, the family members of those that have keratoconus, because we do know that you know if one person in the family has keratoconus, there is an elevated risk of other family members developing keratoconus. And uh, there are a lot of key opinion leaders in my field that um, are very excited about this. We shall see, though, if this really has lasting value. Um, I did publish earlier this year in re review of corneal contact lenses my initial experience with uh, one of our patients who has keratoconus, his uh, sister, his half brother, um, one of his aunts has keratoconus. The DNA samples from this individual submitted three different occasions. The risk score for keratoconus they each came out differently. And the genetic variants implicated for keratoconus were also different between the three different um, submissions. So my point is that in this case, at least to myself, even though there's a lot of marketing um, promoting this, at the present moment, it has not established itself, uh, to me at least, to be valuable. But I am hopeful that in the future, that as the um, uh, genome-wide association studies, the database grows, that it may be valuable. But it's a reminder that in no case do I feel um, as clinicians and also patients, shall we put heavily weight um, and you know pursue these treatments that have not yet um, established themselves ahead of uh, proven diagnosis and treatment. So I do want to delve into now some uh, specific areas of misinformation. Uh, what I hope to have done is given you some background on the ecosystem of uh, information and perhaps uh, help you with kind of pre-bunking, uh, whereas now I hope to kind of debunk some specific areas of misinformation. So misinformation bit number one, uh, we have patients that believe that keratoconus continually progresses through their life, whereas in fact, Keratoconus, we know that it usually develops during the teenage years, and it progresses um, for a number of years before typically stabilizing um, by the late 20s into the 30s. Now, there are exceptions where it can develop a little bit earlier or a little bit later in life. Okay, So generally speaking, though, um, if you have keratoconus, no, it does not keep progressing to the point where the cornea thins out and perforates. Um, I've been in clinical practice since 99, seen a lot of keratoconus patients. None have had corneal perforation. Um, and corneal transplantation is not the necessary uh, endpoint for all patients that have keratoconus. It used to be historically about 25% of patients with keratoconus 
would end up needing corneal transplantation. Um, but today, it is much less than that. Uh, there's one paper that showed that overall the rate of corneal transplantation has a recent, it's decreased by about 80% for those with keratoconus as a consequence of the efficacy of corneal cross-linking, uh, the procedure that slows or stabilizes uh, from further keratoconus progression and also because of the success of these new contact lenses for visual rehabilitation, such as scleral contact lenses. Okay, so in other words, if you are diagnosed late in life, in your 60s or 70s with keratoconus, the likelihood is that you've had keratoconus for many, many years. You just never knew about it. It was diagnosed later in life, probably because it's mild, and it's highly unlikely at that juncture that it's even progressing. Now, on the other hand, if you're newly diagnosed with keratoconus uh, in your teenage years, in your early 20s, generally speaking, it can be presumed at that age to be progressive. And one of the standards now is to have corneal cross-linking, a surgical intervention that was FDA approved in 2016, which can slow and halt the further protrusion of the cornea. Misinformation number two, um, there are so many of patients that I've come across with keratoconus that have come into the office um, having been told that rigid surface contact lenses can slow the progression of keratoconus, as if there's this notion that the rigid lenses act like a compression garment or girdle in holding back um, tissue. But there are actually a number of studies that have shown that this simply is not the case. Um, one of the uh, compelling papers was published uh, last year, where the authors found that based on corneal tomographic evaluation over five, six years, the effect of long-term rigid gas permeable contact lens where it had no effect on keratoconus progression. Okay, so the treatment to alter and slow the progression of keratoconus is the FDA approved version of corneal cross-linking. Uh, the use of contact lenses with a rigid surface, it is to restore vision. Um, there is just no other uh, alternative except for uh, rigid contact lenses to recreate a smooth light bending surface. This kind of builds into misinformation number three very large number of uh, patients that I see with keratoconus feel that they need to seek some surgery to restore their vision. Whereas in fact, you know, the main surgery that is done nowadays for keratoconus corneal cross-linking, it actually is not to restore vision, it's to prevent further deterioration of vision. Uh, the key for vision restoration, again, is contact lenses. All the surgeries that are out there, whether corneal cross-linking, intacts, Ferrara rings, conductive keratoplasty, intraocular lenses, they can help vision to some extent, but that's not their main use case. Um, this paper nicely summarizes that despite advances in the surgical treatment of keratoconus, contact lenses remain an important and popular option for visual rehabilitation in keratoconus, with various designs enabling a large proportion of patients to attain satisfactory vision. Misinformation number four is there are patients that believe that eye exercises might help. And if you search online, you will find this YouTube video about eye exercises for keratoconus produced by somebody that is apparently just a lay person. There is an outfit out of Australia that promotes aerobics vision improvement um, exercises for keratoconus. And this YouTube video on the left, uh, this is a good example of how something that is popular um, but not necessarily has the veracity uh, can spread. You know, this video that has almost 30,000 views. Both of these um, claimed treatments promote the Bates method of eye exercises, which is a practice that was made popular by a New York ophthalmologist after he published in 1920 this book called Perfect Sight Without Glasses. And at the time, it was a bestseller. It had tremendous consumer appeal. 
and he recommended three things, one of which is sunning. Basically, staring at the sun, which we now know can cause permanent uh, vision loss from solar retinitis burns to the retina. Two, he recommended palming, which is pressing against your eye using your palm, which in our patients with glaucoma can actually exacerbate vision loss, uh, increasing intraocular pressure. And then he recommended shifting, which is kind of looking back and forth with different fixation points between two objects. Uh, Dr. Bates was convinced that poor vision was always due to nervous tension and um, just kind of the need to relax the uh, mental system. It has since been definitively debunked, but it continues to resurface in different forms. Um, it kind of has a cult-like following. Misinfo number five, um, there are individuals that believe that supplements can help cure tachonis. And this is one of the deals where, you know, as a consumer, again, if you want to believe something, you can find something online in the virtual world that will fulfill that desire. Uh, there is um, this doctor from out of the country that promotes Ayurvedic treatment for cure tachonis, of which he suggests that bilberry capsules are very effective in managing several eye conditions such as keratoconus. Bilberry has an interesting history in eye care because um, this is like a cousin to blueberry. Back during World War II, the Royal Air Force rationed bilberry jam and tea to their Air Force pilots. And shortly thereafter, their pilots started bombing their targets at night with incredible accuracy. And the Royal Air Force pointed it out to being because it was this bilberry um, tea and jam that was being rationed. But in fact, it was a diversion from the fact that the Royal Air Force had acquired radar. After the fact, it just turned out that bilberry was discovered to be a potent antioxidant. Uh, and so therefore, it still kind of has maintained the notion that it might be helpful for vision. The best data about it uh, there was a study done um, over 20 years ago in Pensacola, Florida at the uh, at Naval Medical Center where Navy SEALs trained, where 15 Navy SEALs were given bilberry nutritional supplementation. And after three weeks, their visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, all these metrics of vision were evaluated, and there was nothing different. Dietary supplements they're regulated in a different manner than drugs. And this has been the case since 1994. There is a Dietary Supplement Education Act, uh, which was shepherded through Congress by the late Senator Orrin Hatch in Utah, where in Utah, the, multi, the, the, the nutritional supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. And this legislation freed the manufacturers of dietary supplements from FDA regulation, which is to say that they do not need to prove efficacy. That's to say that, you know, the dietary supplements, they don't have to um, do what the labels imply, nor do they even have to show that they're safe, which sounds incredible, but that's just kind of the way uh, that dietary supplements work. They're, they're more kind of these foods. As long as the labeling has a statement on there that says these statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, this product is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure, or prevent any eye disease. Now, the, the manufacturers can make structure function claims such as, you know, this dietary supplement promotes the immune system or visual system. They can't say that it cures cancer, but they can make these strong implications. And for that reason, these dietary supplement manufacturers, they don't have any incentive to prove that their products work because they'd rather spend the money towards fancier labeling in marketing. Uh, and this is how come so much of the dietary supplement space, um, there just isn't the information, the evidence-based support um, for uh, suggesting in the recommendation of these, these products. They might not do anything, but the question is whether they actually uh, are, are helpful in, in, in certain cases. Now, there are pockets where they are 
proven to be helpful, such as patients that have a condition called macular degeneration, a specific supplement uh, with vitamins A, C, E, zinc, copper, has been shown to reduce vision loss by 25% for patients that have macular degeneration, but there isn't any such correlate that has been found for keratoconus at the given moment. And the final little misinformation bit, um, we have people that kind of think that natural is better. Well, it kind of depends on what you consider to be natural because um, arsenic and cyanide and lead are naturally occurring, right? But a lot of the natural folks tend to gravitate to something called homeopathy. And there's this physician here that promotes homeopathic treatment for keratoconus. Um, homeopathy is a healthcare practice that was started about 200 years ago by a German physician called Samuel Hahnemann. And this was at a time um, 50 years before Louis Pasteur came on the line and before germ theory came on the line. And the typical practices in medicine at the time included bloodletting, leaching, using heavy metals and high dose uh, cathartics. And he was rightfully concerned about these barbaric practices. And so he started homeopathy, which is based on two tenets. The first is called the law of, uh, law of similars, which is, you know, a noxious substance in a small amount allegedly fixes what the noxious substance in the higher dosage uh, creates in terms of symptoms. And then the second tenet, uh, it's most controversial and scientifically disputed. It's the law of infinitesimals, which is uh, these noxious substances, they're diluted serially through serial dilutions. Um, and there are many homeopathic remedies that are labeled 30X, which means that the noxious substance has been diluted 30 times. And the homeopathic doctors, they believe that the more dilution is the more potent that the remedy becomes, which doesn't make any sense because if you have uh, for those that remember back to um, chemistry in college or high school, Avogadro's number corresponds to 23x. So any homeopathic remedy 23x or greater conceivably does not even have a single molecule of that substance even in it. And the homeopathic docs, they claim that it's just each time there is a dilution made that in imparts this kind of energy or spirit to it. But bottom line is that there isn't any evidence-based support um, that is solid and consistent for homeopathic remedies, especially in the domain of keratoconus. So to finish up, to inoculate against misinformation, trust but verify. That's kind of the old Ronald Reagan saying. Um, Bearing in mind that altruism, it's not always a common driver for content generation. Um, always maintain a little bit of healthy skepticism. It doesn't mean to question every single thing that your doctor says or uh, what a company is claiming, but you do have to bear in mind that there isn't always alignment of interests. Avoid shiny object syndrome because new doesn't always mean better or more proven. And conservative treatment and proven treatment, that's really the way to go first. And then also remember that someone will always want to sell you what you want. So beware of the loan practitioner that's offering you a special treatment that no one else aims to offer. All right, time for questions. Okay, Dr. Chu, that was a very enlightening and different, but really important and informative uh, talk. So thank you for taking the time to research all of those um, interesting blasts from the past, what worked, what didn't, what we've learned through experiences, and particularly in your latter half, focusing particularly on kind of misinformation in our keratoconus population. Um, it's interesting because I get a lot of questions about some of the points that you brought up as well about surgery, about 
our GPs actually flattening the cornea. And I think that's a really important one that you brought up. Um, and, and I like to think of it like braces, you know? I had braces when I was in high school. And when I took the braces off, my teeth became kind of crooked again. So there's like, you know, your eyes get molded a certain way, but when you take the lens off, it comes back to its natural shape. And um, so I think that was a very important point that you made, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, in terms of questions, interestingly, we don't have a lot. I think it's because your topic was so kind of very unique, and I, I'm sure that you've left uh, our audience kind of pondering and wondering all about a lot of things now. But I wanted to kind of touch base on a couple of points that you made, um, maybe or maybe not related to keratoconus, but about the misinformation. So it's funny that you mentioned the 20-20-20 rule because I actually tell that to my patients quite a bit. And I don't really know where I... I learned it from, but I even tell it, you know, to my family because it seems that taking a break and looking away from your screen and letting your eye muscles relax, that that's a good thing to do. I didn't realize it was ergonomically like for your hands and, and, you know, to, to relax your joints, which I get, but um, given that that, you know, kind of came from someone not in even the ocular field. Do you ever recommend that to your patients? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't personally recommend the 20-20-20 rule. I mean, it's a, um, I think the appeal of that is it's very simple and there is a tendency for consumers to want simple explanations yep. um, for things that may become very nuanced. Um, you know, another good example of misinformation uh, in our eye care space is um, the, the information regarding blue light. Um, mm, I yeah. think you and myself, we have so many patients that um, have a strong conviction that uh, blue light is bad and that their digital screens are the primary source for it. Uh, it's a very nuanced and much more complicated topic, which is not as well supported um, by the science as concern for ultraviolet light. Um, and, you know, to that point, um, you know, uh, the, if, if blue light even is problem, problematic, the main source is the sun by a factor mm -hmm. of 100 to 500 times intensity. But we have kind of these personal feelings that um, you know our digital devices create problems and this desire to want to believe that makes us vulnerable for corporate interests that promote and um, allegedly solve that solve that problem. Um, but but yeah, in many cases, uh, you know, I'm not the arbiter per se of what is misinformation or not. It's really the community of ICR practitioners. Um, the industry. And one of the things that also makes apparent what is um, bad information, it's time. Um, COVID is a great example. Back during March 2020, during the COVID lockdown, um, even the researchers didn't really understand the transmission route of COVID. There was a lot of attention put to surface disinfection, people buying Lysol spray and and um, now, of course, we know the primary treatment uh, or rather um, transmission route is through aerosolized droplets. So um, and, and, and my point is that what constitutes misinformation has become a little bit of a politicized word. Uh, it, it's often we need time to kind of make a judgment and to, to digest what is correct and what isn't. And it's a moving target. Uh, and, and with regards to cured conus, maybe you can comment on this, is, you know, there's always something new coming along the newswire about cured conus, about a new eye drop or glasses or a new contact lens. And I, I get it. As a consumer, if I had cured conus and I saw that, I, I, I would naturally gravitate to it and go in and ask 
my eye doctor about it, but um, why does that gain so much more attention to all these excellent proven treatments that we have nowadays with these new contact lenses and um, you know corneal cross-linking? I'm sorry, what exactly was, repeat your question again. I'm sorry, that was kind of long-winded. But um, I, I think that, you know, as a clinician, you certainly, we all have patients that have care to cause patients that read about something that is new. Uh, you right. know, these new wavefront guided contact lenses, these new eye drops that are in the pipeline that yeah. may be an alternate for corneal cross-linking. Uh, report about these glasses being developed overseas for cure to conus. Um, and so there's kind of investment in future promise opposed to the fact that you know there's something compelling stuff today that uh they may not have even um right. considered and and so, so how, I, okay. I agree so it's like why are you always looking for something new that no one's ever discussed or has any scientific support in right so compared to what's proven, like developed contacts that have been written about and it's been reported in pure literature or about outcomes from transplantation or about um, effects of cross-linking. You know, why do people look for like really obscure things? And I think, I think it's not just related to keratoconus or eye care, but we're always looking for something new just like you said this like shiny silver like new sparkly new product and i think that's something that we as humans are constantly looking for it's what's well if it's been five years there has to be something better right it can't be the same contacts that my doctor fit me in five years ago there's got to be something better and i think you know, we need to understand that change doesn't necessarily come about so quickly, like every two years. And some things that have been proven to be effective, like rigid gas permeable lenses or scleral lenses or, you know, outcomes of transplantation, effects of, uh, you know, cross-linking, these things have been reported on, yet they might have been offered already or discussed and maybe didn't cure the patient's disease and what they're looking for is something to fix their disease when in reality maybe there isn't anything that can be better than what they have at least now now you know some exciting things in the pipeline i think for keratoconus patients are improvements in contact lenses um, improvements in the optics with correction of higher order aberrations, improvements in the ways we're fitting lenses so they're more comfortable, improvements in materials so there's better oxygenation. But I think people always want to look for huge improvements and maybe don't pay attention to the subtle improvements that make a difference in day-to-day -day life. So I think that's just our human nature, that we want that new shiny piece of uh, you know, technology or something that can save my eye. And people ask me, can you just give me an eye transplant? And I said, no, that's not possible. So um, let's get to just a few other questions. Uh, one of our audience members asked, uh, did you say that corneal perforation, uh, and then they put in parentheses, high drops is not as common as thought. So maybe you can clarify the difference between high drops and corneal perforation? Yeah, that's a great question. So corneal high drops, it's a complication that occurs in advanced keratoconus uh, where one of the deeper layers of the cornea called dust maze membrane, it cracks and then there's fluid that can imbibe and swell up the cornea. Um, that is to be differentiated from perforation where there's just a through and through um, hole that forms in the cornea. Um, there is another type of corneal thinning disorder, which is even more rare than keratoconus, called keratoglobus, where corneal perforation can occur. Um, but it's corneal perforation. It, it, it at least you know I've never witnessed it. Have Have you, Dr. Gloria, in your clinical so practice? I haven't, and it's interesting because I have some. Uh, older keratoconus patients 
one in particular that I can remember, and his central corneal thickness is a less than 100 microns. It is so thin, and every time I look at him, I'm, a, I'm afraid it's going to rupture with a sneeze or a cough, but uh, he's in his 90s. And he's been doing amazing. And the interesting thing is we, his eye care team with his ophthalmologist decided to transplant one of his eyes, the one that was thinner and it was less than hundred microns. We did a corneal transplant in that eye about 10 years ago and he's doing fine in that eye, but he's also doing fine in his other eye that's similar thickness or thinness. So in my, uh, in, all of my clinical years and experience, you know, I was, you know, about 15 years, I, I have never seen perforation from keratoconus alone. Now that's different if you develop, say, like an ulcer and then it thins and there's an inflammatory process, but keratoconus alone, I have never seen corneal perforation. So um, there was one question, I think I'll take this, it's a pretty easy one. What is the technical term for gas permeable lenses for keratoconus? That's just the term. So gas permeable, um, so when we say RGPs, that refers traditionally to the smaller hard lenses that sit directly on the cornea. So um, rigid gas permeable lenses are those small corneal lenses, but you're right in saying maybe there's confusion because even larger scleral lenses are made from gas permeable materials. So we need to clarify the type of lens versus the type of material used to make the lens. So scleral lenses are made from gas permeable plastics, but an RGP lens or RGP contact is referring to the size, which is the smaller hard lenses that sit directly on your cornea. All right, maybe we can take two more questions. So someone has asked, my eye doctor has told me that children are more likely to develop vision issues in late teens due to staring at small screens rather than watching TV from the couch like we all used to in the past. So they're not essentially exercising their eyes. Does the 2020-20 rule, which you have discussed, does it combat myopia? Right. Um, I'll let you comment on that. How's that? <laughs> So that, I feel like we need a lot more time to go in the details of this because it affects different people, people differently. Accommodation, um, near work. There have been studies that have shown that near work, working inside, not getting outdoor light can lead to myopia progression. The 2020-20 rule, as you said, I don't think there's ever been actually a clinical trial looking at effects of myopia based on taking breaks every 20 minutes. It would be interesting if someone did that. But for me, I feel like taking breaks is good and looking up is good and I try to do it myself, but I can't say that it's proven to combat myopia. Yeah, I will add that, you know, the major determinants for eye focusing disorders and eye disease their genetic predisposition and number two, age. Those are the two major elements. Now, there are other factors um, that can play in, ranging from environmental, diet, and uh, a whole slew of different things, but uh, the major elements seem to be um, practically things that we can't control. Um, but, you know, I understand the concern and, and um, there's a lot of interest in our industry about nearsightedness and which is myopia in trying to alter its rate of progression um, a little bit different from from cure to conus but um, um, you know eventually maybe there will be opportunities in the future for us to also regulate um, the development of cure to conus right now it's kind of a blunt instrument but it's corneal cross-linking Right. Okay. Last question that we have time for is, should keratoconus patients be wary of profit um, for corneal transplantation from clinics? And I know this can be taken in various directions, but if you could answer that in 30 seconds. 
Yeah, um, when corneal transplantation is recommended, there's usually a reason for that, really for the benefit of the patient. Um, now, obviously, the the clinicians and the hospitals, they need to make it financially viable um, so that they can continue to provide the service in the future. But I would say that the vast majority of clinicians, if they're recommending corneal transplantation, it's because it's needed. I agree. And I think one thing to add to that is usually there's a significant degree of corneal scarring or thinning that cannot be corrected by specialty contact lenses. So I would think if you've tried forms of contacts, you've failed them, it can't correct your vision because of the state of your cornea. I work with ophthalmologists on a daily basis, and if I felt a patient I couldn't correct visually to their uh, liking or to, to give them the visual function they need, then I do refer for corneal transplantation, although I do have to say that it's pretty rare because our contacts these days have just um, improved so much that we're getting good comfort and vision for the majority of our patients. So I hope that all of you enjoyed this really special, unique presentation tonight by Dr. Brian Chu. And I hope you also picked up on the fact that the bio that I read in the introduction was false, although they were pretty cool um, claims, they were false and misinformation. So be careful of what you're hearing. If it sounds too good to be true, maybe do a little bit more research on it. Um, but thank you for bringing um, this topic to our attention. And let's see the last slide, if you could um, forward to that, Dr. Chu. All of you, I hope that you can join us on November 8th, Tuesday evening at 6, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Our title is International Perspective on Keratoconus Surgery by Dr. Jack Parker. So thank you all for joining us this evening, and I look forward to seeing you all in two months. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.